it impacted it impacted how I uh, experienced the world. Um, so I went on to uh, found as an adult, the Black Jewish Liberation Collective. Um, and the Black Jewish Liberation Collective really came out of a sense of we are in the Black community organizing against racism and dealing with all of these things. And the Jewish community has been supportive, but there are times over and over again in our movement spaces around anti-racism, whether you look at the civil rights movement or you look at um, the current day uh, anti-policing movement, there are ways in which moments in these movements history that um, white the white institutional Jewish community gets scared um, and, and pulls back, right? There's a freeze. Um, oftentimes it's related to Israel or Zionism, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes there are all kinds of reasons why this happens throughout history, but it happens. Um, and it felt critical for me um, and many of my comrades to create a space where we say, no, actually there are Black Jews. And when we're in the streets fighting um, against police brutality, like we are still Jewish and anti-Semitism actually matters and still matters. And the reverse that we are, when we are at synagogue and um, in our Jewish community spaces that those community spaces take racism seriously, that we're able to navigate those spaces safe, safely and comfortably, um, that we're welcomed, and that those spaces aren't, um, be, aren't uh, endorsing harmful policies that actually have an effect on us and see us as deeply part of the community. So the Black Jewish Liberation Collective came up out of that um, and continues to be a space where we amplify Black Jewish voice. So my entire experience in life has led me to this moment where I'm able to talk about this really particular intersection of being Black and being Jewish and being really steeped in both of those cultures and communities. Yeah, for sure. I really hear you on that sense of... Um the way in which there's a conception, I think, within both the Black community and the Jewish community of the communities having moved away from each other. And I think it's interesting how you describe um, maybe, you know, the struggle against anti-racism um, and anti-Black racism specifically as being something that perhaps some Jewish institutions or the Jewish community in general has sort of felt itself moving away from. And it's interesting because in the UK, um, there is a very particular way in which black Jewish relations kind of play out at that mainstream level. And it's around this idea that Jews don't count. Um, and so there was a book written by David Bajil called Jews Don't, with that title, Jews Don't Count. And I think there's a couple of central narratives or discursive steps that the argument takes. So it starts off, by arguing that number one, and anti-Semitism isn't taken seriously by the wider anti-racism movement and by society more general. But then there's a, which I actually completely agree with, you know, the reality is Jews don't count. But then there's a second step that it takes. Um, and it says that this is particularly egregious because all other forms of racism, specifically anti-blackness and specifically Islamophobia, are taken seriously and are never tolerated. And we saw that narrative playing out, for example, in Stephen Fry's Christmas message, uh, where he said that anti-Semitism is the only respectable form of racism that, that's left. So there's this mutual sense of the communities moving away from each other's struggles. Um, so what do you make of this account of, of, of racism and of anti-Semitism? Well, first of all, I am the I, I want to say, actually, I disagree that that um, anti-Semitism isn't taken seriously. Um, I think that there is a ton of solidarity work that has been done here in the U.S. particularly um, that I'm so I'm always you know, in this conversation, speaking from my experience and my perspective here in the U.S. And i um, excited also because there's some pieces of this that actually translate and travel across the pond, so they say. Um, 
so for me, it's not true. And I think it's not true because I have um, intentionally been part of a lot of efforts to um, bridge that gap. So the Black Jewish Liberation Collective is part of um, a larger strategic vision of, yes, actually, one of the reasons why anti-Semitism is not deeply embedded in the dialogue uh, uh, of, of the anti-racism community and the anti-racism movement is because we have not been lifting up Black Jewish voices. Um, so there is a sense that like, oh, there's not a lot of Black Jews. There are a ton of Black Jews and a ton of Black Jews in, in the movement spaces. Um, and those folks um, need to be at the, the policy making tables, in the think tanks, in the conversations that are driving these movement spaces so that we can bring our full selves, right? Um, and part of it is not only showing up in those spaces as Black, but also showing up in those spaces as Black Jews. Um, and so that's another level of movement spaces doing their work to deal with anti-Semitism, right? Like cultures of um, uh, not acknowledging that Christian hegemony exists, that um, it's automatically assumed that we should um, do something around the Christmas tree lighting because that's a that's that's a big event. And so let's plan an action around that, right? Um, and while that may be true, there's an erasure or like a lack of understanding of like, actually that is very Christian oriented. And there is like a huge um, wealth of ritual technology and of culture that Black Jewish folk can bring to the movement around anti-racism. Um, and so for me, I've seen us do that and it takes effort to show up in that way and claim space and take up space as Black Jewish leaders, which I, which is what this organization, your organization, Shanice, is working on and doing is uplifting those voices and bringing them to the forefront. Now, I have, um, I, I, I want to say that, you know, in New York City, we have organizations like J French that have invested deeply, um, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, that have invested deeply in solidarity work and in showing up um, in, in anti-racism spaces, uh, because this, oftentimes what happens, and I think what is um, notable is, like I said earlier, saying the Jewish community is often synonymous with naming Jews as white people, right? Um, so there's an automatic idea that when you talk about Jewish people, you're actually talking about white people. Um, and there's not a broad acknowledgement of the diversity of the Jewish community, um, which at least here in the United States, some estimates say that there are about 20 percent, and that may be a conservative estimate of Jews of color. Um, so not acknowledging the diversity within the Jewish community, uh, but also this idea of Jews gaining access to uh, white privilege and then what that then means for how the Jewish community aligns itself politically around issues of race and racism. Um, because was James Baldwin's historic argument, wasn't it? Exactly, exactly that. Um, and, and, and then we see this come up where, so for me also this, um, I was part of the organizing, um, in 2019 of the women's march where anti-Semitism was a big deal and it threatened actually to shut down the women's March, uh, because some of the main lead organizers, um, Linda Sarsour, Tamika Mallory, were accused of being anti-Semitic uh, the summer, so like August, before the Women's March, which happened in January of 2019. Um, and they are in deep solidarity and in community. Um, I, I'm a, a friend of Linda. We organize together. Um, Linda shows up. And so um, that it was another space in which um, myself and some other um, Black Jews and Jewish women of color really showed up and said, no, 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 let's not use 
this and let's not use claims of anti-Semitism, misuse, misuse claims of anti-Semitism to uh, attack uh, Black leadership, Black and Brown leadership, uh, Muslim leadership, right, around, particularly around feminism. Now, I want to move to your point on um, this idea that uh, it, it, other forms of racism uh, are taken seriously and not tolerated. There's a, to me, um, pop culture and what happens in the public dialogue does not always translate into policy and action. Um, and we see, I see that right now with Palestine solidarity organizing, where so many people in the United States are calling for a ceasefire. Overwhelmingly, the public writ large is calling for a ceasefire, and our policies, our, our policymakers, our, our government leaders are just not doing, um, in, they're not in line with the people who elected them, right? Um, and I'm also seeing in real time anti Semitism being used. Uh, being misused as an instrument towards um, racist and white supremacy actions, not only in response to our international policy around uh, Palestine and Israel's war in Gaza, but rather, uh, but also in addition to that, uh, the, by, the, the extreme heat that Dr. Gay, um, who is the president of Harvard University, um, our country's most, one of our country's most prestigious um, universities, uh, was, was pressured essentially to quit because of um, claims of anti-Semitism, which were completely falsified, right? Um, so this idea that that Jews, this narrative, Jews don't count, is coming over. It is traveling across the pond. It is traveling across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and I'll tell you a quick story here. I have a friend who works in New York City government, um, and uh, there there were some challenges. Um, and one of the, the resolutions was to go on a listening tour and really sit with a lot of um, Jewish leadership in, uh, in New York City. And one of the things that uh, this person heard was a lot of Jews are beginning to say that um, Jewish people never benefited from the civil rights movement. Um, and Jewish people don't benefit from anything related to fighting racism. Uh, and in conversation with me, like, I, one, number one, I was shocked that that was that that was a narrative that was coming up um, from major Jewish institutional leaders. But because of the work that I do with Diaspora Alliance, I was clued in ahead of time because this is the argument that has been being made in the United Kingdom, right? In the UK um, and, and in Europe uh, more broadly, that this idea that Jews and Jewish people are not part of um, a larger idea of what it, what the anti-racism movement is pushing forward. And I think there's two really, really scary things about that. Number one is um, that to me uh, doubles down and emphasizes the way that Jews actually, that these Jew, these particular Jewish leaders are seeing themselves and purporting towards white supremacy. They're positioning themselves in a position of white supremacy by in a position of accepting white privilege and saying like, no, we're white. We don't benefit from those things, right? Like if you're saying you don't benefit from anti-racism, then like, yeah, what that means, what you're telling me is that you acknowledge your white privilege and you're doing everything you can, including misusing claims of anti-Semitism to protect your privilege rather than um, 
saying, landing in solidarity and saying, you know what? Yes, we have white privilege. We have been afforded white privilege. And if it means that we negotiate some of that so that there is equity across all of our community because all of our Jews need to experience safety, then we will be with that. You're not saying that, right? So that one piece is you are actually telling me you're acknowledging your white privilege. But the other piece of that is you are misreading and misunderstanding what actually anti-racism is about by, um, by saying Jews don't benefit from anti-racism. You're then saying that anti-racism is just reversing white supremacy. Anti-racism is not about putting Black people, it's not about flipping the script and putting Black people on top of any. So how do we make sure that uh, we invest in equity across our community? Um, so sure. I, I, you know, clearly have a lot to say about this. <laughs> so I want to I want to pick apart something that you mentioned around governance and particularly this question of the state and how the state mobilizes racism anti-Semitism and how philo-Semitism, you know, um, the love of Jews and the love of Judaism actually ends up being anti-Semitism. And I think you pointed at exactly that point, which is the way in which politicians or the state use Jewish experience and use Jews as an in-between guy, as a fall guy between the powerful and um, the black and brown people. So I'm thinking, for example, recently in the UK, we had a government minister saying that we need to have less migration because more migration means more anti-Semitism. And I mean, if we look back historically, um, even at the founding of Israel, so Balfour and the Balfour Declaration, he was an anti-Semite and he saw the founding of Israel as a resolution to the UK's Jewish problem. Let's get them out the way, but specifically let's get them out the way so that they can be the in-between between the powerful West and the angry Arabs. So there's this way in which once again, always historically this this notion of philo-semitism the state supporting jews actually ends up being a form of anti-semitism using jews as a tool to divide and rule jews and other black and brown people um so i guess my question is you know there has been this historic relationship and solidarity between Jewish people and what Fanon called the wretched of the earth, the globally oppressed. Um, so how do we disrupt the state and politicians' attempts to co-opt Jewish trauma and Jewish struggle in service of white supremacy um, and racism? I mean, no hard questions today, huh, <laughs> Uh, yeah. So one is I want to make sure that all the folks um, today and watching understand what philo-Semitism is. Um, so philo-Semitism is, like you said, a love of Jews, but it's oftentimes um, actions or behaviors or attitudes that purport to um, at, disproportionately admire the Jewish community um, and, and put, put Jewish people on a pedestal often related to um, the cr Christian theology around uh, the, the return of the Messiah, um, the rapture and other things like that. Um, and, and it relates off, often to um, an admiration and a particular protection of Jews that is not equal um, for any other community, right? Um, so what we're talking about is exceptionalism, one way or the other, right? On, in the negative way or in the positive way. And so what anti-Semitism, for me, what fighting against anti-Semitism is about is fighting against any kind of exceptionalism and fighting towards equity. Um, and so when when we um, when we think about um, rebuilding the uh, Jewish solidarity and uh, 
the state's attempt to co-op Jewish struggle and grievance. Um, one of the hardest things is, uh, for, from my perspective, is combating the whitewashing of history. Uh, and I see so much, especially because it was just Martin Luther King Day here in the United States, let's say that we recognize the efforts of Martin Luther King Jr., um, who was um, a, a, a leader in the civil rights movement. Um, and I'm just seeing so many people uh, tagging him uh, and, and reposting quotes of him, et cetera. And part of the problem is like, if you were to come, Shanice, to the US on Martin Luther King Day, you would think he was like the greatest thing since sliced bread. You would think like Pete, when he walked, people were kissing his feet. You would think he was like, I don't know, like the Pope or something wild, right? Like he, you, you might think he was some kind of saint. The reality is that he was not. He was um, watched on the FBI watch list. He was, uh, a lot of people did not approve of him or like him or support a lot of the things that he did. Um, and that's why, you know, a lot of people still call it a civil rights struggle. Uh, it was not an easy thing that just happened. Uh, but the whitewashing of our history is the problem because Right now, our young people are taught that he was so great and everybody loved him and he marched on Washington and he got the Civil Rights Act, Act passed um, without acknowledging all the way, all of the challenges about his, his leadership, but also all of the challenges amongst the ranks of what it meant um, to walk with him. And when I think about that, and I think about how the state will often co-opt not just Jewish struggle and grievance, but anyone's struggle, anyone's inequity is going to be used if it's useful, right? Um, and so we, part of our work as organizers um, and as people who believe another world is possible and fight for equity is to stay rooted in a clear understanding of what the what our vision is and what the vision of the right is, right? The, the right in any space. I'm talking about conservative leadership. I'm talking about white supremacists, Christian supremacists. I'm talking talking about people that are pushing authoritarian and fascist agendas, we have to understand what is their vision? Because when we can understand what their vision is, we can begin to see the way that they take people, use them, and then discard them in the same way that here in the U.S., Jewish um, fear is being instrumentalized in this moment. So we see that through um, invocations of the Holocaust as it relates to October 7th. October 7th was the worst thing to happen to the Jewish people since the Holocaust. That statement right there triggers uh, tr the lizard brain. So as a social worker, I go into thinking about trauma, trauma response, um, and how people navigate what are symptoms of PTSD, what are symptoms of intergenerational trauma. Um, and I am seeing all of that happen in real time. And not only is that happening because it's real, but it's happening even more because it's being exploited. I mean not to say that it is real. These fears are real. Anti-Semitism is real, it is scary, and your fear of it, the pain that our ancestors have experienced around anti-Semitism is being exploited in this moment for a political project that does not serve the wider Jewish community. Um, and so that, that for me is important to, to remember and remain clear that there we have to stay vigilant in what we believe our own vision for freedom and equity in our community is.
Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, co-optation is is one of the classic, oldest, most historic forms of divide and rule and divide and conquer. And, you know, I think when you look at the trajectory that the historic Black Jewish Alliance has moved in from one of maybe like a coarse solidarity where there were tensions, but ultimately we were fighting the same struggle to now this almost complete divide. There is only one direction. There's only one um there's only one class of people who's, who's, whose interests that serves and that's neither Jewish nor, nor black people. Um, and so I think, and I, I wanted to kind of touch on this notion of fear and, and historical trauma and, and notion of safety. And because obviously, you know, even, um, white Jews in the West who may have assimilated into whiteness. The reality and, and the, the reality of anti-Semitism is that, you know, the Jewish position in society is always fragile. Um, you look at any point throughout history where Jews have maybe, you know, become a little bit more stable and felt a little bit more safe and secure, and then it's kind of ripped away again. Um, and that is repeated throughout history so many times. And so I think, um, you know, this question of safety, this question of existential threat, this this, this fear um, is a real central theme, I think, um, in, in, in the Jewish community and also a starting point for Jewish politics. So with that in mind, I want to take this kind of theme of safety and turn now to abolition. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, I co-authored a book called Abolition Revolution um, with one of the co-founders of Black Jewish Alliance, Avia Day. Um, and I'm an abolitionist and Shoshana is an abolitionist as well. And I wanted, I wanted to explore the connections between abolition and the question of safety. Um, because oftentimes within the Jewish community, specifically within Jewish institutions, um, safety and, and trying to achieve safety often heavily relies on carceral systems. So the police, hate crime legislation, prisons, surveillance. Um, and you know what brought me to the Black Jewish Alliance is the fact that my partner's Jewish, and so now half my family are Jewish. And so I have a really close connection to now the Jewish community and Jewish institutions. Um, and like like other people, like other of the black Jewish members in, in Black Jewish Alliance, I've been denied at the doors of a shul, of a synagogue. And that is an experience that I've had. It's an experience that a black Muslim member of the Black Jewish Alliance has had. And it's also the experience of a black Jew in the Black Jewish Alliance. So this is a, this that that confrontation when Black people enter Jewish institutions is a universal um, experience. And that actually came out, so the Board of Deputies did a report of the experiences of, of Jews of colour, and that came out really strongly um, in that in that report as well. And we, and we know, for example, in the UK, and obviously it's, it's the same in the US, you know, Black people are made unsafe by police, by surveillance, by carceral systems, were seven times more likely to be killed following um, restraint from the police, uh, were five times more likely to experience violence and force from the police, were 8% of people killed in custody, even though we only make up 3% of the population in the UK. So this is a huge tension, I think, for modern day Black Jewish solidarity. There is this, within Jewish institutions, this over-reliance, this hyper-security culture, um, this over-reliance of carceral systems that then make black access to Jewish institutions sometimes really difficult, sometimes really scary. Um, so I guess the question is, how can abolition, how can this notion of building a different form of communal safety help us rethink a, no a notion of Jewish safety. I really appreciate this. And I wanna take a step down from the institutional and just start with the personal. Um, because I think that we, first of all, um, we conflate and interchange ideas of safety and security. 
Um, and I've, I've learned this concept uh, from a friend of mine, a black uh, trans Jewish organizer here um, who lives in Minneapolis, who works in the Jewish community um, around safety, uh, who he taught me, um, NZ Tanner, who taught me that um, safety and security are actually quite different things. Um, and we should really uh, interrogate the way that we interchange those ideas um, and that language. And so I like to start with safety because safety to me is about, it's, it's, a, it's a personal thing. Um, safety is true. The truth is that safety is a mindset. Um, and it first starts similar to anxiety with your perception of the world and what you are taught is safe or not safe in the world based on your social position based on whether um what race you are your class status uh your religious affiliations your um gender identity all of those things are are in, influenced what we believe about safety. And so, because as, as a femme person, I was taught like when you go out in the street and you see um, a, a man or a male presenting person walking towards you, be more alert, right? Um, and that has to do with my gender and not at all about my, my race, but that just further shows that Safety is about your social position and it's about your mindset um, and what you've been taught based on who you are and also your community of origin. Um, and so that needs to be taken in. When we talk about Jewish safety, we have to think about what we need protection from. Um, and, and what exactly do we need protection from, right? Um, then on the note of security. Oh, Shoshana, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt you. You're breaking up a little security. bit. we think of I'm sorry can you hear me now yeah yeah, yeah that's better am I better yeah your video is getting okay. a little bit um, Apologies. <laughs> yeah no worries so I think I I I, I heard and you at what you were saying how that applies to the notion of Jewish safety yes um so who we have to think about who uh how do jewish people perceive themselves and who do we as jewish people want to um be safe right like what what are the things that we want to be safe from that helps us reorient to how then do we need to be thinking and moving a lot of safety actually relies in prevention there are so many studies that have shown um here in the u.s that have shown that um policing um and and security does not actually keep people safe, um, it does not prevent, police do not prevent crime. Um, and they I, they don't even do a great job of responding to the crime. Um, but what they do do is um, they create an idea, a reliance, a crutch. Um, they disable our ability to be critical thinkers, to be vigilant about our own safety, and they allow us as a community to be lazy around actually creating safety practices amongst and amongst ourselves and within our community and with allies. So instead of reaching out to other communities who um, 
who are similarly targeted by some of the same um, oppressions, we instead lock ourselves in, right? Um, and, and securitize ourselves, which creates isolation rather than solidarity. Um, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but th actually that's such an important point because we're seeing the rise of anti-Semitism at exactly the same time as seeing the rise of of Islamophobia and, and these street-based attacks highly likely to be um, motivated by the same kinds of racist thinking. So what could it actually mean for, you know, shuls and mosques and Jews and Muslims to think collectively at that communal level about keeping each other safe? And then what kind of influence could that have on the wider political discourse for those kinds of communal community-based solidarities and approaches to safety? Um, what impact would that have on the political discourse if, if that was happening? So, yeah, it feels as if there are, you know, and, and as you said, you know, policing, it, it, it must feel reassuring to have a security guard outside a shawl. But is that actually going to stop the guy with the gun coming in? Probably not. Right. 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 Exactly. So exactly. how do you then think that communities can keep each other safe? Um, what what does that look like? How does abolition help us, um, you know, think through the idea and the notion of safety and of just living in the world in a you know in a prosperous way, um, but doing that together without the reliance on systems that are ultimately violent and harmful to many different communities, not just the black community. So how do we keep each other safe? I love this question, my favorite question <laughs> of the night. <laughs> um, for me, I I think that it is first, again, um, going on the multiple levels. I feel like almost every question I've done this where we start out with the micro and move to the macro. So the first step for me is starting with the self and dealing um, on an individual level in the Jewish community with internalized anti-Semitism. How have we actually like taken it taken anti-Semitic ideas and beliefs and um, like internalize them and build them into both our own understanding of who we are and also how does that impact um, what we're scared of or who we think we should ally ourselves with, right? Um, and then do the same thing in the Black community. So like, what is our practice around anti-racism? Um, and internal and looking at the self and dealing with internalized anti-racism. Uh, but further on the macro level, um, it is about building coalition and building solidarity. Um, like anxiety, most of the time, the people that you're most scared of are the people that are actually going to have your back. <laughs> um, I, I have found tremendous love and support and solidarity from the Muslim community way more than from the Christian community. Um, and so it, it's really about thinking about what does it look like for us to be actually in uh, solidarity with each other, step out and lean into actually meeting people and breaking down those barriers and collaborating and seeing each other, taking action together in the streets, uh, for me is the best form of solidarity and coalition building. Um, it, we could talk all we want ideologically about why we our organizations or our community should work together. But until we actually do the thing, show up in the street together, uh, show up at and create an event to get host an event together, have a conversation, then that's when the real work happens where we actually build those relationships. And so it's also about um, the Jewish community showing up for the Muslim community when the Muslim community gets attacked and that happens in reverse as well. Muslim community showing up for Jewish community, Christian communities, everybody actually coming together. Um, and I've seen that solidarity happening here, like locally in the United States 
part of JFRED and their work of safety and solidarity in the in New York area. But I've also done that as part of the Black Jewish Liberation Collective organizing um, on an international level where we reached out uh, at the Christchurch shooting in New Zealand, um, at, at, uh, the mosque in New Zealand and said like, like lesbian solidarity, let's show up for people across the across the world. And that is also part of the work of Diaspora Alliance is supporting a multiracial democracy and thinking about like, we cannot actually have a democracy unless everybody is participating and everybody has a voice and everybody has equity. So how do we do that? It's like actually by being in conversation and being in community together and taking collective action. Yeah, and I think one thing that really strikes me about, so taking the conversation back slightly on this notion of collective action and where one of some of those opportunities might exist. And I mentioned earlier about the fragility of Jewish acceptance into whiteness for white Jews. And I think one of the places that that has really come out where you're seeing the almost re-racialization of some Jews, specifically anti-Zionist Jews, is in the confrontation right now within the Palestine solidarity movement between the police and anti-Zionist Jews. And, you know, we've seen this in the UK where um, a group of unsuspecting white Jews did a protest at King's Cross Station and did a prayer protest and it was violently shut down by the police. And we've seen the same with anti-Zionist um, Jews being violently shut down in Germany and Jewish students in the US being, you know, ripped from their beds in the middle of the night by police. And there is this, this way in which some Jews are being now, I think, re-racialized um, as targets and as, as legitimate targets of, of police violence because they are anti-Zionist. And I think this, once again, I think shows the fragility of um, the way in which Jews are, are racialized as white. And, and you know, perhaps this is a Perhaps this is a place where solidarity can take place around, you know, the question of the state and police violence. But one of the barriers, I think, to solidarity is, of course, anti-Blackness and anti-Semitism. And I mentioned earlier that Black Jewish Alliance was formed in the context of um, in 2021, when the Black and Jewish communities were essentially at war um, <laughs> because of comments that were made by Black celebrities. Um, so I'm thinking of the comments that Whoopi Goldberg made, the, the racist comments and, um, and you know, veering on Holocaust denial um, that Whoopi Goldberg made and, and the comments of, from Kanye West. And then in the UK as well, we had um, racist comments by a, a well-known rapper called, called Wiley. So I think Oftentimes these anti-Semitic con 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 comments are made in the context of black people trying to rationalize and understand their experience of oppression in, in the world. Um, so I guess my, my, my question to you is, why is it that some black folks reach for conspiracy theories when trying to understand the black experience, the global black experience, and what can we do to challenge anti-Semitism in the black community? Uh, I want to respond to that question. Actually, I wanted to sh I wanted to, to to comment um your your comment about the re racialization of of anti Zionist Jews is um landing so well for me because uh it, it further proves the point that um on, on my perspective those are the Jews that are actually being told you're not actually Jewish. Um, so it further proved this point of the entrenchment of, uh, of a particular section of the Jewish community into whiteness and white supremacy. Um, and, and thus, we know who runs our education systems. Our education systems are run by, uh, 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 dominated by people, uh, by white people who are writing the books and um, teaching the classes, et cetera, uh, at least here in the United States, and I believe so in the UK as well. Um, and so for me, part of um, under the first place to begin understanding how there are um, Black folks who are 
um, leaning on anti-Semitism as a way to understand is number one, we have a really poor education system that doesn't teach us to think critically or understand anti-Semitism at all. Um, in the United States, in my education, like anti-Semitism, the, the, the entirety of education around anti-Semitism was the Holocaust happened never again period right and and there's and now i'm seeing this whole thing of how never again actually got interpreted differently by different people <laughs> like, oh that's not what you meant by never that. again but or never again for us <laughs> exactly exactly I'm like wait you really oh we were i thought we were talking the same language but i guess not right so part of it is that and, and the other part of it is that i think that um people of color everybody writ large is um uh, susceptible to um, what anti-Semitism looks like currently, because the vast majority of what anti-Semitism encompasses uh, today, and this is not historic, historically it looks different. Um, and and part of the, ch the challenge of understanding anti-Semitism is the way that it has evolved over time to play different roles. And today, a vast majority of what anti-Semitism looks like is actually conspiracy theories, right? Not the whole of anti-Semitism, but a lot of it is related to belief in acceptance of and perpetuation of conspiracy theories, right? Um, and so that that is pervasive throughout our society, um, even from, from very small things to very large things, um, it is everywhere. And I think the difference here is that these uh, that people of color and other marginalized groups, um, when being anti-Semitic, uh, are um, have a particular target on their back, such that um, they are integrating conspiracy theory, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. I would say at the same rate as many, many other, if not. It, less than many other white uh, celebrities, but we don't see those white celebrities being accused, being held to account, um, being uh, uh, judged, being fired. Um, we don't see any of that happening, right? Um, so the thing about anti-Semitism is that even when other group, other marginalized groups employ anti-Semitic um, conspiracy theories as a way to kind of understand their own oppression, right? For uh, true or not true, um, in an effort to understand and make sense of their plight, they then adopt and, and incorporate anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, but they, because they are not white, they are more prone to the backlash because it's easy to punish um, and, and criticize, critique and uh, address non-white folks, right? Yeah, so I, 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 yeah, I was just, uh, just, just on that point, I think, I think you're absolutely right. And I think there's a couple of, there's a couple of things that I want to draw out from what you said. Um, and, and I think one of the dynamics is, um, the system that we live in is in crisis, right? We've got war upon war upon war, climate catastrophe, um, cost of living crisis. People don't have money anymore. Jobs don't, jobs don't mean living. Jobs just mean surviving. Um, and at the same time as we've got this global crisis, people don't believe in revolution anymore. <laughs> so people don't believe that there is actually a way to come through that crisis, um, to liberate ourselves, to, to, you know, get to a better world. And so within that context, they reach for these explanations um, that maybe, you know, if the Black Panther Party still existed, they would provide a better explanation for why the system is in crisis and why you know your job doesn't pay and why your life is crap um but failing the existence of you know 
I guess those those really powerful liberatory organizations that can provide that explanation people are reaching for conspiracy theories um and and as you said when when it's then you know as as I, I use the term that Fanon um um coined the wretched of the earth people who are already oppressed when they reach for those explanations then face violent rebuttal um but I think there's that secondary thing that's going on that you touched on around the fact that it is people of color, it is your black and brown people who are more likely to face reprisal. Um, and I think that comes back to that dynamic of the way in which the state uses anti-Semitism as a tool to divide, divide and conquer. And I actually think so. So one of the members of Black Jewish Alliance, Jewish Alliance is Barnaby Rain, and he's he's written some really quite interesting things about this dynamic. But in a context where you know it's the state telling you that your parents can't come here because they're going to be a threat to Jews, and that's coming from the media, that's coming from the politicians, that's coming from people who have power. And as you said, in the context where there are no other explanations, where education, the quality of education is low. People are going to then be like, OK, well, why is the media telling me this? Why are the politicians telling me this? Why are rich people telling me this? It must be the Jews. Um, so the way in which the state uses the Jewish experience also now makes anti-Semitism a, a more likely thing um, and, and makes that, that being able to reach for, you know, this idea that it's Jews that rule the world more likely. Um, and I think that's another reason why, I guess, um, rebuilding connections between black and brown communities and between, you know, um, black Jews and the wider Jewish community feels so vital um, because we're literally in a context where the state would rather have us stabbing each other with knives than face the <laughs> fact that it has created a system that simply doesn't work. Um, and before we move to the question and answer, I, I want to throw one final question at you, which is maybe a little bit more positive um because <laughs> uh, we've had we've we've touched a lot on kind of what the tensions are where the difficulties are um so the, the the historic black jewish alliance um there were lots of historic examples and as you said those examples aren't just historic there's a lot of work happening today but a few things that i want to point to are new york's international ladies garment workers union the civil rights and the black power movement there's this perception that jews didn't support the black power movement that's not true one of my uh, mentors show um was a polish jew who grew up in the u.s um and was uh, Jewish feminist, really prominent in the Black Power movement, um, and she organized Jews with Jewish feminists within the Black Power movement. And also, you know, looking at Jewish organizing and apartheid South Africa, looking to London, the Battle of Cable Street, there are so many examples that we can point to of where this Black Jewish alliance has um, reaped rewards, you know, brought us closer to liberation. So my question is, where are those opportunities today? How can we renew solidarity between Black and Jewish communities today? I mean, I'll speak broadly and then a little bit specifically, so I'll reverse sure. my course <laughs> from the rest of the questions, which is, uh, it, it's really coming together and, and, and being in solidarity and hitting the streets. Like I said earlier, like, why are we take, what can we take collective action towards? Um, and then specifically, you know, I'll, I'll speak for in the UK, you know, the Black Jewish Alliance and your work um, in, in coalition uh, and, and working together with other groups um, and uh, working with Diaspora Alliance. We had um, an event back in June together where we first met uh, and this event, and I hope to see us continuing to collaborate together um, and specifically working on things that that matter, whether that uh, right now is around solidarity uh, related to um, ending the, you know, related to a calling for a ceasefire um, or racial profiling um, and, and dealing with police violence um, in a real way. Uh, I think that we have a lot invested together because um, the same people that are 
creating and perpetuating anti-Semitism are the same people that created and perpetuate racism and anti-Black racism. Um, and so we need to remember who our common enemy is um, and put down uh, all of the, the smaller um, pieces of uh, privilege that we might have picked up along the road, whether that's related to class or race privilege, um, et cetera, really coming together to understand that we are in a time right now globally where we are facing unprecedented levels uh, of um, rising authoritarianism, um, rising anti-Semitism, uh, a, uh, rising uh, poverty um, and uh, and uh, climate displacement, right? Um, we're seeing not only war refugees, but climate refugees. And so we need to really come together because we are, uh, like you said, coming to a precipice. The time is now to really come together and let go of what's been holding you back um, and really dream together. I, I, I really am sitting with what you said about people not believing in revolution anymore, Shanice. And I, I just am thinking you know, like, we have to keep dreaming. It is the only way forward um, to, to create space. And I think that's what so many, so much, um, I think that the anti-racism movement has to offer uh, a movement towards ending anti-Semitism is uh, um, tenants around uh, well pacing, right? Um, uh, tenants around rest and creativity, uh, because those are the things that are going to allow space for us to dream again, um, to remember that uh, it is possible for us to uh, create equity and to build another world. Um, and as we see empires falling, now is the time to double down on our dream. That's amazing. Thank you so much, um, Shoshana. I'm really glad we were able to get through those questions in an hour and have a bit of time for um, some questions from the floor. We've got a few that have come through, which are really interesting. So guys who are listening, uh, we're hoping to conclude the call in about 20 minutes. Um, so thank you so much for your patience. Um, so yeah, let's have a look at some of these um, questions that have come through. And Feel free to still send some questions through um, if you have something you want to ask either of us. But we've had, um, so there's one question around, there's a couple of questions around capitalism and both the connection between capitalism, class and race. Um, but also Annie um, has asked a question and so I'll, it's a bit of a long question, so I'll, I'll read it out. Um, but she asks, do you think there may also be some factors uh, which are rooted in how we experience capitalism through race? Kind of thinking through mm. this question of anti-Semitism in the black community. So she goes on to say, in a similar way that we're called upon to believe white people behave in particular ways because of something essential about their whiteness, for a black person like Wiley, who grew up in a historically Jewish neighborhood like Bo in London, they will, might see Jewish people in positions of authority as acting from some essential Jewishness, as opposed to acting from their class position, which is as landlords, let's say. Um, so how, I guess the question is kind of pointing at how do we confuse these things called race and confuse them with say class? Um, and how do we experience capitalism through race? I think this is such an important question. I'm so glad it was asked because um, that is, I think, uh, one difference um, that I see, which is in the UK, I believe uh, that there is much more of a class distinction. Um, I think in the United States, we don't, and I, maybe it's actually to our detriment that we are not actually dealing with class enough. Um, but I think that there are certain dynamics that play out in the UK uh, around class and the way that class and race uh, are interconnected, um, specifically in the US because 
racialized capitalism meant chattel slavery here in the United States. And that has had a different um, impact on what the Black community looks like here, our particular traumas and how we have managed to um, access wealth. Um, that said, I think that uh, there, there's a huge difference. And this is one of the main differences, I think, between um, dealing with fighting um, racism, fighting racism, anti-Black racism and anti-Semitism, which is that in the sense of capitalism um, and class, uh, those are two, the racism and anti-Semitism do two different things. Um, they deal with those groups actually differently um, and position those groups in opposition to one another. Or as um, or, or I would say Jews, because of anti-Semitism, are positioned in the uh, uh, capitalist system as middle managers or the go-betweens rather than experiencing a experiencing direct oppression. Um, and so what that results in is number one, like a reinforcement of all of the anti-Semitic conspiracy exactly, theories exactly. for the black community. <laughs> and then number two, it also does not, um, it, it does not clarify or magnify for white Jews how they are actually being a pawn in a larger system. Um, and it creates this, uh, uh, a mythological, uh, you know, model minority of like, well, the Jews made it. Look at the Jews. They worked so hard and they, you know, got out of poverty and look at them now. And it's like, no, actually what you're not paying attention to is that's part of the game, right? Um, so it's part of the game to put somebody in place such that um, when the, the system falls, you will not actually blame the owners of the system. Yeah, yeah, you will yeah. blame the middle managers, right? So it and that is actually the historic role of the Jew. That's the historic role as well. Um, that's not something Correct. that just started Tax today. Collectors, exactly. Yeah. Loan loan officers, bankers, all of, real estate, all of those things, right? And where, just just exactly. to add on to what you're saying, I think what this often doesn't acknowledge as well this idea of the Jew as the model minority is that working class Jewish culture was annihilated in the Holocaust. The, you know, the Jews that were able to move to the US were the ones who could afford to do so um, and who had the means to do so, or who had the connections um, to do so. And a lot of Jewish uh, working class culture was lost um, during that genocide. And so, yeah, not only has that been the historic position um, of, of, of Jews as that kind of middle manager, but also like the Bund and, and working class Jewish cultures that we might have looked to don't exist in the same way. Yeah, yeah. And I think it, it's particularly hard also for uh, Jewish folks uh, for us to look at um, how capitalism is playing out for us because what capital the other piece here is that capitalism ensures to demonize communism and part of the demonization of communism is that jews created communism yeah <laughs> right so so while we are winning at the game of capitalism we also created the antithesis which is communism right you can see like how this actually doesn't make Makes sense, which means that it's not real, but this is how these stories are constructed. Um, and it creates a challenge again with the internalized anti Semitism of like Jewish people, what do we believe about ourselves? Like, do you actually believe in the idea of pull yourself up by your bootstraps and meritocracy and you just work so hard? Or can you see how you are actually being played as a pawn? Yeah, for sure. Um, so another question that we've got, and I think this is a little bit more of a personal question as opposed to one of, of political organizing, but someone has asked, um, so my father is an Ashkenazi Sephardic Jew. 
He was demonized marrying out of the faith. I want to connect to my Jewish heritage more, but don't feel welcome by the majority because my mother is not Jewish. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Um, because And the person says, I see many struggles parallel to those who are mixed heritage from the, around the world. And just to be clear, Black Jewish Alliance has a very inclusive um, approach to Judaism. But yeah, Shoshana, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that because like, number one, get in community, like get in community with your people. Um, so, and that is why I created the Black Jewish Liberation Collective. Um, it is why I'm so loving and supporting and wanting to uplift the work of the Black Jewish Alliance in the UK um, and, and others around the world doing this kind of work because uh, part of, a, one of the, one of these core things about Judaism is like, yes, it is a religion and spirituality. And so that is part in part very personal, um, but it is also really communal. <laughs> Um, the Jewish people are really tribal <laughs> and, 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 and lots of what it means to practice Judaism is about being in community. Um, and so number one is about being in community. And I, I don't, as a mixed race person myself, I don't think of myself as half anything. I am whole everything. I am fully Jewish and fully black and fully Ashkenazi. Um, my mom is Ashkenazi, white Jewish lady, and my dad is a black American. Um, and so I, I'm deeply, deeply moved and like feeling on so hard, feeling you on what it, what, the struggles are with navigating the community as a mixed race person. And um, I just invite you to be in spaces with other mixed race people and, and have those conversations. And also like, you know, the, don't let anybody claim your identity for you, right? There, there is uh, external, like how people receive you, but there's also who you are for yourself. Um, and what those things mean to you. Um, and for me as the Kohena, as a clergy person, it's really important that I affirm that it, you need to do what is best for you and root down in who you are. Um, and don't let anybody take that away from you. Don't let anybody police you out of your identity. So as we're talking about abolitionism, like one of the things that happens in the in the Black Jewish community and in many communities is like people get start policing each other's identity. And I am not for that. I will say that like there are some uh, particular synagogues or rituals or things that um, if you wanted to be a part of that specific thing, you may need to participate in some conversion process because that is that community's particular practice. Um, and that is not all of Jewish community. Um, and so there there are spaces where you be reach out, get involved, build community. Awesome. Thank you so much. And we take the same approach in, in the Black Jewish Alliance as well. So for sure, um, you are welcome. Um, so there's uh, so I'll take one more of the questions that we've got from from the Q&A, um, which is thinking about the fact that there is a long history of black thinkers drawing on Jewish thought to analyze the black condition, um, but that there are actually competing traditions that do so. So one tradition connects black nationalism within a framework that sees Zionism as a mirror of itself. Um, and nationalism as the solution for black people in the nation state. So that's, you know, I guess your Marcus Garvey, Back to Africa, the Liberia Project, et cetera. Um, but then there's another tradition, and I guess that's tr the tradition that we're trying to tap into, uh, which sees radical Jewish traditions of the diaspora um, that saw the solution to Europe's Jewish question as universal emancipation. So that universalist approach, I guess almost abolitionist approach of, None of us are free until until we're all free. And that was certainly, you know, the philosophy of, of the Bund, for example. Um, so I guess I guess taking a question from that point is how do we tap into that to that notion of universal emancipation? Um, where are and 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 I guess you know that's not a concept that's entirely popular um within Jewish or black thinking at the moment. So how do we get there? 
Mm. And I guess, and I guess one I think, more thing to add yeah. is there's certainly, there's certainly in the modern context, the way in which we are taught to see our struggles for liberation as just our own. So in the UK, for example, the idea of black people and South Asian people coming together to fight racism, it's kind of like a no-go um, zone. We We look after ourselves we don't need to look after anyone else. Or you're seeing the narrative play out around Palestine. Why should black people care about Palestine? Do the Arabs care about us? That kind of narrative. So there are different traditions, I guess, we can we can draw on. There's one that see us as individual groups kind of competing for space in the world. And then there's another which sees the world as all of ours. I... I'm so grateful for this question because it's something that I have been wrestling with uh, recently, right? Since October 7th, particularly um, as I deal with like, oh, what what does it mean to um, be someone who identifies as a Black radical um, and uh ha have been in and continue to be in community with a lot of black nationalists um and be fighting against that right um i think the thing is there is not the the difference i think in our movement um versus our opponents is that our opponents uh the far right they ha they are gaining momentum because they have one answer and it seems like an easy answer. But the truth is that answer is not doable. Um, and we have to remain vigilant inside of a dream that many realities are. We are uh, the fruit, we have to see the fruitfulness of multiple visions within the left as a strength as like, actually, we have a lot of options for how we can tackle this the, this issue or this problem um, and remaining clear about like staying in the dreaming mode to continue dreaming. Why? Because having one solution or one answer, having a, a very clear static vision, then to me means that we are not able to move and shift. We are human beings. We are alive and our, uh, each one of us individually and collectively, we are evolving. And with that evolution, we are managing what comes up and how things continue to shift. So having a multiplicity of visions of what's possible means that at any given moment, we have multiple ideas of what that shift can mean for our future. Um, and so I, I, I am not, a, I do not identify as a Black nationalist. Um, I am deeply rooted in believing that um, we can create a multiracial democracy where there's safety for everyone in the world and that we are promoting basic human rights across the globe. Um, and that for me is critical that we are able to do this because as we move forward, we are seeing there is not one place in the world that is homogenous. The more that our technology increases, the more that the more we travel, um, we get on planes, we go different places, we learn new languages, we communicate with different people. Like we are becoming less and less homogenous, less and less can you find one place in the world that only has those, that group of people that have all their and their ancestors have been there the entire time. We're continuing to um, grow our populations all over the place. And that means diversity. And that means we need to be thinking about how to be inclusive and equitable anywhere someone goes. I don't just want to be safe in Israel. I don't just want to be safe in Liberia. I want to be safe in New York, where I live. I'm a third generation New Yorker. I want to be safe Anywhere I go, when I come to Puerto Rico, I'm traveling, I travel to any country in the world. I want to be able to be safe, period. I don't want to have to limit myself and the scope of where I exist um, because of nationalist ideologies.
Yeah, and there is that old Jewish saying, you know, our homeland is where we are. Um, and I think there is something and about Papa was a rolling stone. That's what they exactly yeah. <laughs> Papa was a rolling wherever he lay his hat was his home. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I think, you know, there's a real question, which is how do we create that homeland for everyone? And you know, as a as a black person who's um, you know, ancestors were enslaved. I don't even have that place that I can look back to. Um, and so my only choice is, you know, homeland is where I am. Um, and I guess, you know, how can we work together? That's a, it's a huge question. How can we work together as communities to, to make where we are um, our, our homelands? And I think that is, a, that is a wonderful, wonderful place to end because that is, that is our work. Um, and that is the work that we are aspiring to. Um, so I think that's a fantastic place to end. So I wanna, I wanna say thank you so much. Um, it was absolutely a pleasure to have you and to have, you know, a conversation, as you said, across the pond. Um, I'm really, really glad we were able to set this up. So thank you so much, Shoshana. Um, thank and, you for having me. Yeah, thank you. And for those of you who are listening, it was really a pleasure to um, be able to kick off um, the Black Jewish Alliance public kind of public face uh, with you all today. And we are currently in the process of uh, put, pinning down the date of our next um, online meeting. But this year we're also going to be kind of looking at locally in London, how we can do um, in-person meetings, Shabbat dinners and all the rest of it. So please keep an eye on our Twitter and Instagram. If you're not following, please follow those. And if you're not on social media, you can email us at blackjewisha at gmail.com and we can try and keep you looped in. But yeah, thank you so much. It is absolute joy. And here's to more Black Jewish organizing. Solidarity, everyone.